talking with Patsy Oliphant. Patsy, would you please introduce yourself? I'm Patsy Oliphant. I live at 305 North Riverside in the Atlantic. Patsy, you were uh, uh, born here. You're a native. Yes. Uh, you were born in the Melbourne Hospital? Yes, I was. I was born in 1951 at the old Melbourne Hospital on US-1. Uh, I think it's a motel now. Um, and uh, your parents told about your parents. Okay. My parents came here sometime in either 1947 or 1948. And they came here primarily because um, during World War II, my dad was stationed at M McCoy over in Orlando. And he came over here maybe even to, um, he was a pilot, so he might have come over here for some training as well. But he fell in love with this area because my dad was an uh, avid hunter and fisherman. And he saw this area for what it was and knew he wanted to live here. And uh, where were your parents from? My dad was from a little town in Georgia, Matthews, Georgia. He was born in 1919. And my mother was from Burlington, uh, North Carolina. She was born in 1925. And when they came here, uh, did they immediately come to Indy Atlantic, or were they in Melbourne first? And when they first came here, they rented a, a house over on the Melbourne side on, I think it's called Riverview. It's right across the Melbourne Causeway. And they lived just down the street from um, the A.H. Stewart family. And one day, my mother was pushing my sister in a baby bucket, buggy just down the sidewalk. And Miss Stewart came out and introduced herself to my mom. And she said, oh, you have got to meet my um, daughter-in-law, Mary Jane. So she introduced my mother to Mary Jane Stewart, who was married to um, A.H. Stewart, Jr., also known as Bud Stewart. Um, we all called him Bo. He was a chiropractor here in Melbourne. and. Um, Mom and Mary Jane became fast friends, and that's a friendship that lasted for well over 50 years until my mother died. And your father and build a house? Yes, he did. Um, let's see. After my parents got here, um, they decided to come over and buy a purchase land in Indy Atlantic, which they did on the corner of 2nd Avenue and Magnolia. Um, Riverside Drive is what it's called now, but at that time it was called Magnolia Avenue. And so they were renting, at first they were renting a house right on the river, and their next door neighbors were Bert and Betty Jean Maxwell um, of Maxwell Brownlee Funeral Home. So um, then they moved up the street to a little house that is now currently lived in by Diane Taylor. And while they were living there, that's on 2nd Avenue. That's on 2nd Avenue. Uh, my father's older brother, Harry, who was a master carpenter, and his wife, Ruby, came down from Georgia and moved in with Mom and Dad and this little bitty tiny house. And then the brothers proceeded to build two houses, one for, um, one for my family and one for Uncle Harry's family. And about that time is when I was born, and so all the time they were building it, um, you know, Mom would take me down there, and I, as a matter of fact, one story said I, at one time, crawled away from home. I crawled down the street, and they found me next to the open septic tank uh, <laughs> while Dad was building the house. Nobody knew I was there, just throwing sand in, but... And... Um Tell about the flood. You talked about okay. Um, there was a major flood in Indy Atlantic. Now, I was still quite young, so I can't give you the exact year. It was in the early 50s. Um, but all of Indy Atlantic flooded. And at that time, we had no sewer system. All we had was ditches and um, canals up further north. Um, but the whole place flooded. And it flooded almost to the top of where it would have come in the doorway of our house, but thankfully Dad had built the house just high enough that it didn't come in. But after the flood, it, there was just standing waters for days and days and days on end. And of course, as a child, I wanted to go out. I wanted to get in the water and wasn't allowed to. But it was the frogs and the other bugs that were incessant during that time. I thought I'd go nuts even as a child. Do you remember... Um 
your your parents telling you not to walk barefoot or you'd get hookworm? Well, they couldn't keep shoes on me. Um, I was always told to put on shoes, but I rarely did. And over time, my feet became pretty tough. Walking barefoot here as a child, well, for anybody, it, in the Atlantic was sand spurs, sand spurs, coral snakes, rattlesnakes. Um, <laughs> the, the paved roads were gravel. They weren't fun for bare feet. There was a few sidewalks, so um, even though all the children ran around without shoes, we would stop at neighborhood houses that anybody that had a sprinkler on in their yard or a hose on, we'd stop and cool our feet off and is then proceed on. Is that sulfur water? It was sulfur water. Um, Indy Atlantic didn't get city water till sometime in the 60s. Um, so until that point, everybody that lived on the island had wells. And you had deep wells and shallow wells. And I guess the deep well was the drinking water one. I've forgotten. <laughs> <laughs> Tell the story about your how your mother got her lawn. Oh my gosh! Well, the the lot that they built on, of course, had been clear cut, and it was nothing but sand. And my mom wanted grass so badly, but mom and dad really didn't have a lot of money in those days. So um, there would be sod trucks uh, going around to various people's yards that people that did have money to buy sod. But the roads, of course, back then were <laughs> really pretty bumpy. So the sod trucks would hit a bump, sod would fall off, and my mother was the best scavenger for sod. Uh, she would stop in the middle of the bridge if she had to and jump out and grab it and throw it in the back of her car until she finally sodded a good deal of her yard. <laughs> you know? um, tell a little bit about the bridge and life um, under the bridge and around the bridge and okay. what the river was like. Well, when I came along, it was um, a cement bridge. Up in O'Galley, the bridge was still wooden, <clears throat> but our bridge was cement. And there was, you know, relief bridges that we used to fish off of almost all the time. And even my mother's parents, when they came down, would spend hours on end standing there fishing um, on the relief bridges. Or we'd go to the big bridge, and that's where we mainly do a lot of shrimping um, and fishing. But underneath the bridge were catwalks. And my dad was good friends with the bridge tender, Boyd Martin. Um, so daddy was pretty much allowed to go anywhere he wanted to. And he and my sister primarily would go underneath and go on those catwalks and catch blue crabs and bring them home <laughs> for dinner. Was the water clear? Um, yeah, the Indian River, it, would have its days when it was clear, but it it all wasn't always real swimmable. Um, in the early days, the sewage went directly into the river, and especially on the west side, the smell would be pretty bad sometimes. So there was times when you stayed out of the river even way back then. Do you remember phosphorescence? Yes, I do. Um, at nighttime, when the when the mullet were running or any of the fish were running. Um, it was just long streams of phosphorescence following them. It was incredibly beautiful. And did your dad continue to go hunting? Did he hunt it all on the island? Um, my dad hunted primarily out where it's uh, general development bought land from Carson Platt, um, about 3,000 acres out there. It's where he hunted, but he would also hunt here some. Um, he tried some duck hunting, and at one time there was a duck that would come down to our river every year. They were called coots. And our river would literally be black with coots. Just everywhere you saw, it was just this blackness of coots. So Dad thought he'd go hunting and shoot a coot, which he did. And he brought them home, and Mom cooked them. And that was the worst smelling duck. That you know, It was just horrible. It ran us all out. Daddy never went coot hunting again. <laughs> Were there other kids in your neighborhood? There weren't a lot um, on my side of Fifth Avenue. Um, down the street was uh, Roger and Chauncey Broom, and their children were Judy and Kent. And oh, in the probably around '56, right next door, a house was finally built by Leo Bernstein, and he had a couple of children. But they moved on, and the Bundys moved in, and still currently um, 
Ben Bundy's wife still currently lives in that house. Uh, down the street a little bit further south from the Brooms uh, were the Corliss's. Um, and Mrs. Corliss, who is now Mrs. Toller, Mrs. Zoe Toller, had Susie and Johnny that I used to play with. But there really weren't a lot of kids my, my age. Did polio hit? Oh my gosh, yes. Um, polio took out um, two of my best friends that I used to play with. On the river were, as I said earlier, were Bert and Betty Jean Maxwell, and their children were Greg and Pammy. And Greg and Pammy both got polio, and um, both of them ended up in, in iron lungs. Um, and their cousin, uh, Mike Brownlee, also had polio. They all got it. And, so, and that, that put an absolute end to any kind of visiting. Um, you know, our parents were in a panic during that time. Nobody knew exactly, you know, how you got it. And so playing with other kids almost became just not an option. What kinds of things did you do during that time? Do you remember read or? Um, I was very much an outdoor child. And the, the ditches often called me because they were full of mollies and guppies and little spotted fish that I didn't know what they were. But I would catch them and put them in jars and bring them home. And, um, of course, there was the river. Um, I'd Any snakes in the river? Oh, my gosh. One day I was playing with Kent Broom, and I probably wasn't much more than five or six. And we were playing on the riverbank, and it was about three-foot drop riverbank, and right in front of their house. And all of a sudden, um, two moccasins came out of their holes. And Kent... Um, immediately jumped up on top of the riverbank, and I froze. I, I just absolutely froze. I knew these were horrible snakes, and they were dangerous, but I couldn't move. And Kent saved my life. He reached down, and he grabbed me, and he pulled me up. And, you know, of course, we, we ran away, but I'm pretty sure I would have been bitten if it wasn't for Kent. So, Where did you all go to school? Um, Started out, I was actually the first class in Indy Atlantic Elementary, but before it opened, they uh, transported us over to the Melbourne Airport. There were some kind of little Quonset huts over there that we went the first part of the school year in. My older sister went over to um, what's now Ruth Henniger and, and until Melbourne High was built, but I went to Indy Atlantic um, through sixth grade then Southwest until Hoover was built, then I went to Hoover, and then finally to Melbourne High. Did you um, all hang around with, there? were there any kids here on the beach that didn't go to public school? Um, oh, one I remember quite fondly was Hilty Frazier. Um, Hilty was, uh, his parents were well off, and Hilty was a pistol. Um, I remember taking drama classes, and I think it was with Mrs. Kovac over uh, <laughs> Second or Third, Third Avenue or Fourth Avenue. I'm, I'm not sure where her house was anymore, but that was my first introduction to Hilty, and he was a lively kid. Um, and he became friends with all of us, even though he didn't go to school with us. Um, I remember we took a trip one year, 125 junior high school students went to Mexico with five chaperones and Hilton was one of the one of the kids that went and he was the only one that had a pocket full of money um, because his parents were well off but we'd been in Mexico maybe three days when Hilty ran out of money and <laughs> that was that was tragic for Hilty it really was tragic for Hilty and he found out then where when, who his friends were on the trip it was really, it was interesting. Um, did you have TV on the beach um, in the early days? Well, we didn't, um, but the Maxwells had a television and the Brooms had a television. So on Saturdays, I would ride my tricycle over to the Ma Maxwells, and I think it was the Big Top Circus that we used to watch. Um, and my sister and I both would go down to the Brooms house to watch their television. I'm not even sure what year my family finally got one, but we did eventually. What about radio programs? That, that was something, you know, I never bothered to listen to. Um, I was just too did busy. Your, what did your mother do? Did she listen to? 
She listened records. to uh, records. She loved music. It was always on at my house. But my mother actually um, went to work with my father when I was about three. What was your father doing? At that time, he had um, started Oliphant Mutual Insurance Agency um, on New Haven and Melbourne, uh, right across from the Bank of Melbourne. It's a parking lot today. Yeah. And who were your parents' friends? Let's see. Um, of course, Bud and Mary Jane Stewart were some of their very first friends. And I always call them Aunt Babe and Uncle Spike, but that was um, the Sullivans. What was Uncle Spike's real name? I'm not sure. Um, they were friends with the Taylors. They were good friends with the Joe and Evelyn Glover. Um, oh, my gosh. The Dot and Bill Payro. Mm -hmm. Just... Uh, and did they entertain at home? Did they have dinner? Yeah, um, evenings? every, it was either, I believe it was every Saturday night, um, they would all get together at somebody's house uh, and, and do a cookout. Occasionally they would go to restaurants. They used to love to go up to Bernard Surf. That was one of the most popular restaurants for, for all their cronies. What are your early memories of Fifth Avenue? I remember Fifth Avenue, um, it was just a two-lane road with, you know, a few houses and a few stores, gas stations on the end nearest the beach, and um, I remember the Belchers lived right around in the middle, because Mrs. Belcher was the school bus driver at the time, and her children, um, Steve and Tommy Belcher, were mean. <laughs> they were mean. Those guys would beat up anybody. But yeah. Um. When you when you went to the beach, did you ever see uh, marine life? Oh my lord! Yes, and the beach was really different from what it is now. Um, the dunes were much higher. You could just tumble and roll down the dunes. It was a lot of fun. But um, there was a time when. I'm, there must have been almost a, a dozen pilot whales beached themselves in Melbourne Beach. And of course, we all went down to touch the whales. And then there was always sea turtles. Um, my dad had an old Willis Jeep that we would ride on the beach. In those days, you could. You could just go right on over the dunes and down on the beach, and we'd go turtle hunting, but we didn't walk. We went in a Jeep. And you'd see them laying their eggs yes. at night. Yeah, we'd see them. And so forth. And you uh, left for a while. I did. I left after high school and went to college and ended up um, in the suburbs of Washington, D.C. as a school teacher for 25 years. But I got, I got really tired of Washington and all the traffic and just all the hullabaloo. And my parents both had, you know, had stayed here until they died. My dad died in 76 and then my mother in 93. So I'd always come home. I'd come home for summers and this and that, and I loved it here. This was home. Um, and one day I just decided I'd had enough and put my house on the market and swore when the day it sold was the day I was going to leave. It did, and I did. And I came home um, in 1998. And how does it feel to still be living in the house you grew up in? It's, uh, it's my little piece of heaven. Uh, the house is so familiar. It's built from... Uh, cypress and redwood. It was the wood of the day when my father and uncle built it. And I just, I just know every nook and cranny of it. Um, the house has lots of windows, which I still open up to catch the breezes. And unfortunately, all it had for heat was a fireplace. Evidently, when my dad built it, he didn't realize that it could get quite cold in Florida. So all we had for heat until I went away for college <laughs> was a fireplace and then eventually a little oil burner that he put in. And when I went away to college, they put in central air and heat. But I grew up in a time where the summers were so hot and you'd lay there sharing a fan with, I'd share it with my older sister, it was one of those that would rotate back and forth. And you just kind of lay there in your underwear on top of your sheets, sweating terribly, because it would get really hot and muggy in the summers here. In the summers, did you um, stay pretty much, before you could drive, did you stay pretty much on the beach, and when did you learn to drive? <laughs> I learned to drive when I was 10. Um, 
I said my dad had an old Willis Jeep, and that's that's what he taught me to drive in. I had to load it up with cushions in the back of it and on top so I could reach the clutch. But um, you know, I wasn't allowed to just take it and drive on my own. But any time I really, really wanted to drive, Daddy would get in there with me, and off we'd go. And at that time, it, it just we didn't worry about police officers. You know, <laughs> we didn't worry about any of that stuff. Because you, you, everybody knew everybody, and if you were doing something wrong, they just say stop doing that, and you did. Uh, but we nobody ever caught me driving at that age. Was there um, a crime that you remember ever? I, you know, I remember walking home from the Bahama Beach Club when I was five years old, and it was perfectly safe. I don't remember any crime other than. You know, kids throwing rocks or you know shooting air rifles or something. So you know something pretty benign, mm -hmm. but nothing nothing really scary. Well, since you live in the same house you grew up in, you were in a good position to to see the changes in Indian Atlantic mm -hmm. and taxes. Oh my gosh! Um, well, when I came home, I was horrified to find the taxes on the house go from seven hundred to twenty six hundred dollars a year um, same house no changes just a incredible tax increase I thought coming home was going to be actually I thought living here was going to be cheaper that's what you know Florida had had historically been uh, a cheaper place to live especially when you compare it to Washington DC and I found quite the opposite when I came home I was very disappointed that property taxes were starting to go through the roof. Insurance was uh, 10 times, 10 to 15 times what I was paying up north. Um, so I was really disappointed mm -hmm. in that, those aspects. In the hurricanes, uh, Jean and Francis, mm -hmm. several years ago, did your uh, father build house uh, sustain <laughs> any damage? Um, luckily, no. And I, I sat through those. Um, my mother had put in storm blinds sometime in the 80s, just on the back porch. So during lulls, I would roll them up and, and you know, watch the trees bend back and forth <laughs> between lulls of rain. Um, but no, the house stood firm. And your business now? Um, well, after teaching school for 25 years, I taught special ed. I came back here and decided I was done with that. Um, and knew I needed to do something. So at first I started working with a friend who was cleaning, doing some house cleaning. And she became ill, so I took over her business and expanded. And then one day, um, Evelyn Glover called me and asked me to take her grocery shopping. And Evelyn is an older woman who was no longer able to drive and needed some assistance, and also the mother of a one of my absolute best friends. And on that day, um, my business daughter, Daughters on Call, was born. Um, and I became a personal assistant for the elder, elderly. And for a lot of uh, sort of pioneer uh, in the Atlantic elderly. Yeah, yeah. I have the privilege of working um, with Evelyn Glover and um, Barbara DeKalb and across the river, um, Mary Jane Stewart. I've been real fortunate to be able to work for the people that have lived here for a gazillion years. Mm -hmm. So you're planning to stay home? I, th I am home. I'm not going anywhere. As long as I can, you know, pay the taxes on my house, I'll stay in it. Mm 